just wasn't pushing, pushing hard enough. That's what she said. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we're excited to be back with you with another episode. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting episode for all of us. Um, got a new guest uh, that most of everybody in the industry is not going to know who it is or, or whatever, but um, we're going to talk about something that pertains to safety and uh, something that people don't really think about at this time of year. So, Yeah, yeah, you got to be pumped on safety. I... Uh... I definitely don't take safety into account as much as I probably should. I but. would say that the large majority of us that uh, push our machines to limits don't really think about safety first. Yeah, safety for me is usually uh, okay. So I got my I got my uh, harness strapped, and then the rest of it is just done with my right and left foot. Yeah, and then I'm good. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big. Uh, if anyone's ever followed me on online, I'm a big proponent of making sure to wear your helmet and to make sure you're buckled up and and all that. And every time I see a a, a UTV fail fail post where somebody's popping out of the machine, it's like that was completely unnecessary risk. So. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um. So, anyways, getting into the episode. Uh, next episode we try to lead into. Uh, we got another special guest. We're uh probably going to be doing um. The next episode at a uh, little event out in Oregon. Yeah, possibly our first remote show. Yeah, which uh, it's going to be. And by remote, we mean like really remote, like not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, sounds going to be an issue. You know, if we if we record in my trailer, it's going to get a little echoey. Um, mm-hmm. Have to find somewhere to do it because if there's one thing I can tell you about where we're going, it's going to be windy. Yeah, yeah, and probably so, rainy. Yeah, hurricane force winds. So it's it might be great riding. Next episode might be in a trailer, might yeah. be outside, might be in a house, might be in, in the, a in McDonald's the cab, <laughs> in the cab of my X three. <laughs> Something. We'll see what happens. Uh, we're at the mercy of the weather on we'll, this one. We'll shoot it vlog style. Yeah. yeah, we'll just have four different people with iPhones out. That's right. All right. So as far as news in the industry, we didn't really have a whole lot. It's being you know bland February and January. Uh, but we did have King of the Hammers this last week, and that just wrapped up the other day. Um, and it was a really great opportunity uh, this year for me because I don't normally get to watch the whole thing. It's usually like after the fact, I kind of skim through the videos and catch up on it. Uh, but this time I was, uh, I happened to be doing a lot of um, house stuff, you know, honeydew lists and cooking and things like that this week uh, to uh, have the, the actual hammers on the TV the whole time. So, and I uh, was able to watch the hammers as it rolled through and the qualifying and, and all of that. So uh, it was a great time watching a lot of the guys out there. We had a number of uh, Northwest guys up there. Yeah, we had a couple local teams, uh, two that I work with specifically uh, professionally is uh, the Hellbent Side-by-Side guys, uh, Kyle, Orsborn, uh, Kyle Osborne and, uh, uh, man, my brain is just not working today, <laughs> Stephen Starr. Uh, congratulations on those guys. Uh, you know, they made it within the time limit and they placed. And they, yeah, and they completed the course yeah, too. Like yeah. it wasn't just one lap, right? Yep. And uh, I believe they came in 31st. Uh, yep, yeah, 31st. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and then finish time um, of eight oh four. Yep, yep. I mean, when you look down below them, there you see like CJ Greaves, um, that that guy's factory Yamaha. You know, there's a lot of talented Sarah guys Price. that they got in front of. You know, Wayne Matlock. Wayne Matlock is always a contender at Baja One Thousand. Um, yeah, and then uh, Dustin our, Jones didn't. Yep. Dustin only did one lap. Wow. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, uh, BJ and Trevor from Addiction Motorsports down in Woodland, Washington, they were a competitor as well. Um, I think both those teams were both running a Turbo S. Um, my boy, uh, Jason Weller, Weller Racing, uh, he went top 10. I think he got he eighth. Was, yep, and this eighth, was, yeah. Yep, and this was his first year on the Can-Am. He was running a 2020 X3 RC last year and the year before that. I want to say the prior three years he was on a YXZ. Yeah. Super built YXZ, too. I'm, I want that YXZ. Jealous. <laughs> but uh, where's that YXZ now? Uh you know what? Before they had I think uh I think last year they ran out of gas, but they were they were in a really good spot before they before they had a failure. I think they uh, might have blown an axle as well. But yeah. uh, you know he he had that YXZ in contention and he even told me he goes, This is a car that can win it, no doubt about it. So yeah. So yeah. the thing I noticed about uh the people that finished the hammers this year in the UTB class, right? Uh for one, there was thirty four or something like that that finished out of 103 yeah um and all the guys that did finish uh top 10 i believe actually i think it was like top seven i think those guys all ran without breaking anything yeah and i think that's the key to hammers if you can stay consistent speed 
not get jammed up in the in the chocolate uh, thunder. Is that what it's called, chocolate thunder? Well, there's chocolate thunder, and then there's backdoor. Backdoor yeah. is a pretty gnarly obstacle. I've stood in it, and it's about, I want to say it's about eye level, maybe just a little bit over my head. Mind you, it's been about two years since I've stood in there. Right. But uh, for a 94-inch to 104-inch uh, machine, it's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, the... Um, I think if you stay consistent and you can and take those obstacles and not get uh, the bad luck of being stuck behind somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, yeah, um, you can actually win that race or have an option and uh, the 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 opportunity to win or at least place podium. Yeah. Um, and as far as back door goes, the thing I noticed was there's a lot of cars that had the uh, bumpers sticking really far out, like they're a multi class car, and the guys that all had the bumpers sticking out all pivoted on their noses and either wrecked or almost wrecked yeah and the guys that just had the bumpers just flush with their radiators or with the front ends were able to pop out because their tires are sticking out right uh so that was an interesting uh area to watch on the yeah. course for sure yeah i've i've only done one race that was kind of like uh one of those endurance type races and it was on a motocross bike i i was in a class of about 45 racers and i want to say i want to say only 12 finished the race um, I went across the finish line and found out a week later that I got ninth and I have no idea how, because, and everybody that was in Correct the race, the time or whatever. Yeah, I mean, everybody that was in this race in every single class got lost, you know, when you're in the mountains of Northern Idaho, you know, unless there's like definitive waypoints and stuff, you're just kind of following the trail and the, cause you guys aren't nabbing. Exactly. And then next thing you know, I'm across the finish line sitting probably as soon as i crossed the finish line within 100 yards i had my bike laid down and i was trying to take a nap <laughs> right it was it was pretty exhausting but uh yeah it, it, once we got into the ski lodge because it was done at a ski resort um we get in there and everybody was talking about how chaotic it was and every you know just people getting lost left and right and right. Like, like one guy who probably would have won it in the uh, in the elite class and the pro class that dude told me he ran 15 miles and the track was 10 <laughs> and uh, he ran 15 miles. He goes, yeah, now I just start battling with this guy, and we had a great time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, it's pretty crazy. So you were asking me before the, we started if I would if I would race the hammers, yeah. and, and I told you without hesitation, heck yeah, that's right up my alley. That's the kind of thing I like where you can bomb across the lake bed full bore as fast as your machine will let you go, and yeah. then and then bomb into an obstacle or up a climb or or whatever, and then. You know, trying to pass somebody on the rocks is always interesting uh, to watch, let alone try. Right. Yeah, I, I'm into it, but I mean, like, like when you look in the wallet, like, <laughs> you know, it uh, it definitely requires a pretty substantial investment. I want the title to my car in hand and uh, be prepared to destroy it for the most part. Right. Like, I, I honestly think if I were to run it, I'd probably want to run it on a YXE just because in my experience, the YXE... And somebody can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the YXE feels a little bit cheaper to repair. Hmm. You know, like I'm in the process of building my X3. It's going slower than my Yamaha. <laughs> <laughs> They're not a cheap car to build. The but, one thing I did, uh, observing some of the conversations about the hammers this year and everything else, um, and then and we're going to get into the Can-Am topic, but uh, was the concept of the narrower guys Mm -hmm. going through the course faster than the wider guys. So the 64s versus the 72s versus the 80s. Um, you know, they they were really saying that, that once you hit the mountain, that narrower platform is what wins. Yeah. And uh, the, it was evident watching those guys move around. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of guys that ran it on a YXE, and they said the YXE really shined in the rocks. But I know for a fact there wasn't a YXE. Uh, well, the ones that I talked to, uh, every one of them was 70 inches or more. So they were all running long travels. But mm. by the time you adjust suspension and put, I think, 33s to 35, somewhere there, right. uh, they were probably around that 70-inch mark. But, yeah. Yeah. And the, so that leads into the topic of, you know, Can-Am taking the podiums this year. Uh, first time Can-Am's uh, taken first and the first time ever that I can think of that anyone besides Polaris has taken all three podiums. Well, uh, was it the last episode that we were talking about that, that Can-Am was kind of all in on this race? Uh, it looks They like were all they, in on yeah. racing globally. Well, in America, yeah, with its off-road stuff, uh, BITD, they've done pretty well in BITD. But uh, the interesting thing was that I got a little bit of feedback, and I don't want to hear any hate mail about this, but, uh, you know, there was some uh, guys that were been running on Yamaha, switch over to Can-Am, switch over to yep. Polaris, and uh, Yamaha was actually okay with that, like, like – you know, they have their top tier guys right. and they're trying to put them into a position to contest for the win. And they think that anybody else 
is in their way, in the other guys' way. I'm like, that is such a terrible mentality to have in a race like this. I'd want every YXZ, I'd want half the field if I, if you could get away with it, you know? Yeah, with a, yeah. With a, with a race like Hammers, you're gambling with uh, basically the drivers, right? You have, there's a certain percentage that's probably going to fail to even finish. There's going to be a certain percentage that even get one lap done. Yeah. And then there's going to be a percentage that finish, but then where are they finishing comparing to everybody else, right? And so the more you can stack that deck, the more likely you are to podium. And I think that's exactly what happened with Can-Am this year. I think they were fully invested in saying, we're making a statement this year. We put out the 195 horsepower machines. We put out a lot of money into getting athletes to come to our side. And uh, we're going all in on making sure everyone's prepared as much as they can be and making sure that the deck is stacked so favorably for us that we can't miss the podium right. and let alone take the all three. Right. Yeah, it's in the like the NBA lottery. The more ping pong balls that you have in the lottery right. thing, the right. better chance you have of getting in there. But I guess that's not their mentality. So, right. you know, I've used the term asleep at the wheel a little bit, and uh, that kind of validates <laughs> right. to a degree. So one of the other observations I had uh, was just how the Pro XP performed in the race. Um was assuming that new platform, new power plant, or it's not a new power plant, it's an updated power plant, uh, just uh, was expecting to see Polaris kind of make a statement uh, this year in Hammers. Um, the width and the platform itself didn't really seem to have a whole lot of impact on uh, the outcome. I noticed that, like I was saying before, the the width of the the 64 inch machines versus the 72, um, the Pro, P, Pro XB being 64 machine, uh, really was able to navigate the rocks just fine. Um, but when it came to the major obstacles that actually set you back, uh, the machine itself didn't make an impact. Um, and I think that goes to speak to the fact that it doesn't matter what machine you have. It just matters how you know your machine, how you navigate your machine, and if it's going to hold up and stay in one piece. Um, that really is what makes the outcome uh, of, the, of the the podiums. Right. I think a lot of it comes into development as well, obviously not being out as long as the Turbo S or the RZR platform, I'm pretty sure had a pretty big factor on them. And if there's one thing that we know for sure is uh, there's no shortage of information out there. We know how to make an RZR tough. Yeah. And uh, I think it's probably going to be about another, maybe another year you'll start to see I, that car having an impact on that race. I honestly think it's seat time. That too, yeah. I think sure. that a lot of these guys that were racing the pros uh, in the Hammers this year simply just didn't have time with a car. Yeah, They literally uh, arrived a few months ago and they started rebuilding everything on the low end, uh, to replace the suspension and all that stuff to make it ready for Hammers uh, and didn't really have enough seat time. I mean, I, I, I would be willing to bet that the majority of those Pro XP drivers wrote it for the first time in an obstacle at King of Hammers the week of. Yeah. I'm kind of interested, too, if it is a little bit of a timing thing, because, uh, you know, some of the guys that we're working with from a marketing standpoint that uh, that are doing going to be doing best in the desert, um, they're running, most of them are running four-seat Turbo S's right. as, as the base for their car. So it, it could be next year, but we'll see. It just I think it, a lot of it's going to be contingent on how how hard Polaris pushes right. these um, these sponsored guys, these factory, quote-unquote factory guys, to move over to that car, you know. Right. So. And I think there's in racing, there's a lot of, like, legacy transition, right? You got stuff that pulls over from last year or the year before because it doesn't make sense to replace $5,000 worth of equipment if you don't have to. Right. Um, and, you know, with the statement that Can-Am's going to be bragging about all year long yeah. this year, uh, a Polaris is going to have to swing back hard. And uh, it goes back also a little bit to my theory of maybe seeing a 72-inch wide Pro XP this year to replace the Turbo S. Right, right. I mean, I, I can tell you right now, if I'm a sponsored Polaris guy, which I'm not, obviously. Um, and Call I us. Have, yeah. We yeah, wouldn't mind. Right. Yeah, and I have a contending car, and it's not on the XP Pro, Pro platform. It's going to take a really hard sell to get me to jump off that. You right. Because, you know... Even if I'm sponsored, I still, you know, results matter. Results matter. And, and the time and knowledge that went into that machine, like you 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 race with it, you break something, you learn from it, you fix it, you go to the next race. Right. You race again, you, fix, you break something else uh, or the thing that you thought you fixed, and then you fix it again and learn from it and move on to the next race. Right. So that, that's what I'm saying, like seat time. I just don't think there's enough time breaking stuff to know where things were going to break. Potentially, yeah. And uh, that's just kind of what ended up happening. And and uh, kudos to Can Am for sweeping. Um, Polaris came in fourth, I think, as far as a podium spot. So just missed it. But um, 
but yeah, it's super cool to see Can Am come out this year and and blow up the scene and and take the win. Yeah, I've been complaining online that people spend more time talking and, and rooting for manufacturers than they do drivers. I can't root for manufacturers because there's too many local teams that are involved in that race. I know too many people that are involved in that race, so I'm I'm definitely rooting for people, rooting for race teams as yep. opposed to manufacturers. But here's the thing, whatever it doesn't matter if you root for a manufacturer or not. Uh, we are all the winners. <laughs> we yeah. we all benefit. Yeah, we all benefit because, I mean, yeah, I've said it a billion times and I've said it on this show multiple times that racing drives innovation. Right. So the more innovation that takes place as a result of what these guys are doing, the better products we're going to get in our hands. Yeah. I mean, that's so. where shock, you know, uh, the progression in shock technology has really taken oh, yeah. off, right? These machines would not be the same machines if we were still running the 2014 suspensions. Yeah. Uh, you know, the pre-Fox shocks and the pre-Walker Evans evolution shocks, uh, evolution of shocks and things like that. Um, we wouldn't be where we're at today with these amazing machines if the progression didn't happen in the race scene to push the consumer end forward. Right, right. Yeah, I've been seeing online too people comp- still to this day complaining about a $25,000 machine. And I'm literally looking at you. Stop. Stop. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, we sponsor a 4,400 Jeep, you know, and, and I think he might, act, I think he was uh, qualifying yesterday. That dude by himself, if you were to buy at retail, his suspension, his king suspension on that 4,400 car, 4,400 truck is, uh, he told me it was $25,000. Yeah, twenty five grand. I would right say buy in to start. Just down payment would be twenty grand on yeah. any of those trucks. Yep. If you hit the rewind button, we've said this before too. You hit the rewind button. Fifteen years, my X three to have that built. Eighty, one twenty five, hundred plus. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Stop complaining. Find a new hobby if that's too expensive <laughs> for you. <laughs> so. Yeah. It. Our industry has gone so far, and it still has so much breathing room to to ex- spread its wings. And, yeah. And grow so, and it's even coming down. Like, I mean, my father-in-law just picked up a KX. Uh, K- picked KRX. Up the, yeah, I picked up the new Cowie, and uh, I, I want to say it was seventeen nine ninety nine. Yeah, I saw That's such I, a killer machine. This for that last price. couple of weeks, I've seen a ton of deals on Cowies, and I think yeah, the lowest one I saw was fifteen five or sixteen five. That's a steal. Uh, you know, before out the door. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it's not. It's underpowered and everything, but it's still a steal. Like for what it is, the platform itself is amazing. I don't even know if it's underpowered. Like when you look at the way it's geared and stuff, it's a it's crazy capable. You know, I I think we've said it before. Man, we repeat ourselves a lot, but <laughs> it's it's all these people online. But uh, yeah, I mean, anybody can have a blast on these cars on all these new cars, and uh, nobody makes one that's just like complete rubbish. You right. know, we could, it's hard we, to buy a bad car now. Yeah, for for what we do, everyone has a has something that would be catered to just an amazing amount of fun. Yep. So. Yep, super stoked on what we're seeing, what we're seeing in the racing as far as King of Hammers goes, and uh, all the drivers. Uh, kudos to all the guys that got top spots. It was an amazing race. Uh, it was amazing watch seeing a lot of those guys flip over and do stupid things on the rocks. Um, but uh, yeah, great, great King of Hammers this year. Yeah. Um, the jump contest went off uh, without a hitch. Uh, Blake Wilkie took the show at 102 feet i think my dude um pretty awesome yeah. it was a little sketchy on the on the on the landing oh. um but uh props to that camera guy not even budging a, an inch for sure <laughs> for sure yeah so um, 580 horsepower to the rear wheels out there with that short of a run-up is sketchy and Go it was ahead. all loose well yeah i've been out there a couple of times and uh it gets windy out there for sure, and you can see. Oh, the wind was straight into the, them. Yeah, yeah, it turned into a kite. <laughs> yeah, so, even a rig that I, I think he told me once his car was about thirty five or three thousand somewhere in that ballpark, three thousand pounds. Yeah, give or take, and it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, no. and once There's the plenty of torque. Yeah, once the wind hits those things, it's uh, all bets well, are off. You put your hand out the window. You, oh. you turn it sideways. You're you're gone. So I busted off fourth gear jumps in my motocross bike in high wind, and I only made that mistake once. Yeah, yeah. It only yeah. takes one butt pack butt fucker to make Big that time. decision. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, um, yeah, great king, king of the hammers, and looking forward to next year. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then best of the deserts about to kick off too. I think the yep. mid four hundred is going to be taken off in about a month, uh, give or take. I want to. Is it, I think is it the, the end of uh, February or is it March the, somewhere? The Laughlin uh, yeah. uh, race is next. Yeah, and you you and I were kind of talking about uh, talking about you were saying that that would be a bucket list race for you, King of Hammers. Oh, for like, sure. The BITD stuff would be a lot of fun for me. I, 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 I kind of put them all together. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that high speed stuff. I love moguls. You know, like when I was a motocross guy, I would literally find stretches of whoops and just try and tackle them as fast as I human as humanly possible right. without killing myself. Same thing. Like I will literally drive my car through whoops 
fast to the point well, like I'll slow down once my heart starts hurting. Yeah. And I mean hurt. <laughs> when you, <laughs> yeah. when your body says no yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah, um yeah, so the the that race is coming up uh this uh and towards the end of February in the 20th, 23rd. Um and then we have a trip going on next week that we're heading off to Oregon. Yeah, looking forward to that. Getting a little test time on the Can-Am. The Can-Am is probably about 5% built right now. We just haven't done anything on it yet, um, but we got to know, we're going to find a great baseline. Um, probably going to ha- have the uh, the ECU flashed before we get down there. So I'm really looking forward to kind of getting some getting some sand therapy. It's it's been a long time. I mean, uh, when was the last time you went out and did like a serious ride? It's got. It's be been a little while. Probably, yeah. It was, I mean, it's like eight months. It it's been August for me because we lost the tie rod on right. on, the, on, the on the BDR. Yep, and then we fixed that in uh, late October or November. So I I haven't gone out and done a serious ride in a long time, and I've taken the Can Am out to uh, Moses Lake a couple of times, right. but right. you're talking like two three hour stretches. So this is going to be amazing. Can't wait. On, on the Maxis Liberties too. So like yep. we're going to be going out. You just picked up a pair of tires and wheels. Yeah. Uh, from Octane Toy Box. Yeah. And uh, shout out some, to those guys. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They they can't uh, just helped me out tremendously. I uh, got some um, uh, sand destroyers. So looking forward to that. We're, I, I didn't want to go with a molded tire because I've used that before. So I really want to get the kind of feel. See how see how it's uh, different. And the rumor is is I should expect a little bit of handling, but a little better handling characteristics. You're going to be lighter, less rotating yeah. mass. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And can't wait, man. I mean, it, the, the internet right now, the Facebook forums and stuff are blowing up with uh, with pictures of what it's like right now in Winchester Bay. And they've had some storms. And uh, out in sand and stuff, especially wet sand, like what Winchester gets when it gets hit by that high wind, it's very similar to snow, you know, from a drift standpoint. Right. So you'll see what normally is a very large dune have the just the top of it just blown out Gnarly. completely. Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're going to have to be careful, but we'll find some lines that just that we can just rail on. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. We could just get, honestly, if we could just get one day, one day that's about 53 to 55 degrees. If we could a, have a bluebird, that would yep, be amazing. Yep. With a little, you know, little to no wind, I'll be happy because we'll get a lot of miles in that day. Yep. So can't wait. All right. So uh, we have a special guest this episode. Um, somebody I've met over the last year uh, doing some East Coast snow shows. Um, and uh, got to know him a little bit and hang out with him a bit and hear his story and see him in action doing some uh, on-site dealership avalanche awareness training. Uh, with us today is uh, Jeremy Henke from Soul Rides up in Canada. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself and let us know where you're at and what you're doing. Yeah, my name is Jeremy Henke. I have an avalanche education and consulting business based out of Revelstoke, British Columbia. Um, you know, I'm a prominent... I'm an ex-pro snowboarder turned uh, pro snowmobiler in the backcountry and um, been buried by a large class three avalanche uh, as well as, uh, you know, done all the things you can imagine when you spend 150 days in the backcountry uh, for the last 20 years, you know, digging out dead people, seeing big, large class four avalanches. Uh, I've had a lot of experience and Right now, I spend most of my time uh, advocating for some culture change inside the snowmobile and motorized communities, uh, you know, bringing awareness to the avalanche problem and, of course, doing some curriculum development as, you know, we're not driving these old machines anymore in the backcountry. We're basically driving Ferraris and uh, and our right. knowledge of about how to read the signs in the backcountry are limited to, uh, you know, just learning to drive. So it's like driving a Lamborghini downtown Japan. Sure, you can drive it, but do you understand how to read the sign? Right, and you uh, primarily deal with guys on snow on these snowmobiles that are you know uh, hundred horsepower or whatever turbos, things like that, um, and they're going pretty much uh, balls to the walls, and they can get themselves in a precarious place uh, pretty much in a blink of an eye, and uh, you can mm-hmm. go through uh, terrain that um, may seem tame and and safe, and then all of a sudden you pop out of the trees and you're on the side of something dangerous. Yeah, hundred percent, totally. So uh, I asked you to come on the podcast uh, in the idea that in the side-by-side world, um, uh, over the last year or so, tracks have really become something accessible by the side-by-side community. And a lot of guys are now able to afford, uh, they've paid their machines off or uh, they've got some money into their machine now and they want to do something new and different. And they're putting these um, you know, multi-thousand dollar track systems on their machines. And uh, when you do that with a high horsepower, long travel kit, 
long wheelbase type machine, um, you can pretty much go anywhere and do anything, right? And uh, these guys are uh, are go going into an, uh, a world that, traditionally speaking, guys don't go into unless they're normally a sled head. And, um, you know, talking with you and seeing some of your avalanche awareness training, um, there's been a lot of kind of eye openers for me as somebody that is um, a community minded um concerned kind of member that want to see the industry grow and expand, but at the same time, be safe to, to tell the story. Right. And, um, and so when we talk about going snow tracking, a lot of these guys will do kind of the safe stuff around the mountains by their house or whatever. But a lot of these guys are starting to drive to places, um, that they go during the summer, these big peaks, these big valleys, uh, these big ranges. And, uh, there's some hidden dangers back there, uh, that you would, uh, be able to speak to here. Um, but I kind of wanted to get your perspective on these guys that are driving out, uh, going, putting a hundred, 200 miles in on tracks and finding themselves out in these areas where, um, typically speaking, you wouldn't be, uh, in a place of, of knowledge or experience. Um, and this industry is very, very, uh, naive on. Yeah. You know, I, I've wrote a couple papers over the years for, uh, for the avalanche community about new sports and avalanche training. And, yeah, you, you know, I was, I was excited to jump on the podcast because I have built some of these units, you know, in the past, I built a 2010 Polaris Ranger and threw some tracks on it and I put a nitro turbo in it. And I was, uh, I was blown away where I could actually get the machine and, uh, we were using it for a snowboard unit and, uh, and now seeing like the progression, you know, 10 years later after building that thing, uh, where side-by-sides have gone and yeah, you're going to start exposing yourself to avalanche train. And, and you do up and down your highways when you're driving. But the thing is, in the highway world, we control the or mitigate the avalanche hazard. And uh, when you're in the backcountry, nobody's doing that for you. It's uh, it's your own responsibility to understand how to manage it. And uh, sure, on a snowmobile, you get up into start zones and, and where you can trigger avalanches. And same with skiing and snowboarding. Uh, in the side-by-side -side world, I, I think a lot of people might have a false sense of security um, that they're not in avalanche train, but it's just not true. And we've built road networks into the backcountry all over, and that's what we're using to uh, to access higher end to these mountain peaks. And as soon as you have 30 to 45 degree slopes above your head, you are in avalanche train. And now it's learning about when the avalanches can happen and how to mitigate them. And sure, you might feel invincible in that unit, but if you go read the news today, you know, in Turkey, and uh, they were pushing snow and they're not so good as us Canadians or Americans at <laughs> estimating, you know, that slow uh, risk and that management. And they, uh, they wiped out 41 people as of this morning. Yeah. So, it was unfortunate. Um, yeah, so, it's an unfortunate thing. And I think people need to recognize that that risk exists and learn how to mitigate it for themselves. So when you said in your introduction, uh, culture changes, is that kind of what you're advocating for? And well, yeah, it had to happen not only for the snowmobile community. And in Canada, we were losing on average about 30 to 35 sledders a year for oh, wow. a while. And and we had one big accident that uh, potentially could have killed 200 people. And uh, that really got public perception wrapped around what the issues were. And they didn't want to see snowmobiling in the backcountry in British Columbia. And because uh, some kids got hurt and stuff like that. Uh, and, and the accidents were really kind of dumb. But part of it was because snowmobiling was on its infancy. Like, and what I mean by that, sure, snowmobiling has been around a long time, but the machines that we were building didn't really get us in too much trouble in the 80s and the early 90s. But right. about mid-98, 2000, we stopped bolting plastic uh, lugs on our tracks, and we were starting to get out there in higher hazard. And, and through 2000 to 2005 in Canada, snowmobile fatalities shot through the roof. And that's because, you know, we just didn't know how to drive. So... I advocate for that awareness inside the snowmobile community, and we've been successful in Canada to reduce our death numbers because it's education. It's learning to drive an avalanche train and getting your head out of the dash and paying attention to what's above you. And, but that also means that we had to change the culture in the avalanche industry as well because the skiers and snowboarders really built a lot of this, and uh, they don't understand how we use terrain and how we expose ourselves to it. So. I do a lot of advocacy right now in the professional avalanche world about the need for, you know, some different development of uh, what we're teaching people in that curriculum. 
Yeah, you, uh, you, you literally just answered my next question because uh, when I was introduced to sleds, it was in the late 90s. So I was on uh, RMKs and then like early 2000s, uh, some Arctic stuff. And yeah, we would go to areas like northern uh, northwest Montana and we would go into uh, on these trail systems and these machines could literally take you anywhere. Just a joke, mm-hmm. you know, and it's very similar to what we're seeing in the side by side industry and how that's progressing, how that's developing. You get these rigs that are kind of uh, orientated and marketed towards just exploring these trail systems. Nobody's doing that. So I imagine you guys yeah. have a lot of rookies and stuff that are on a, an unbelievably capable machine that are pushing limits that they've never explored and it can bite you. Yeah, yeah, and I, I see that coming from the side by side world. You know, I, I see it, uh, it. It's amazing. I think people don't realize what they can get those things into, and and now you have a bigger, different problem to manage than even snowmobiling. Like, sure, the smaller class one, class two avalanche isn't going to hurt you. It's the big class three that's going to bury you in that machine, and then if it doesn't bro- break the windows out of it, you're going to lay in that machine for a long time, and it's going to be really hard to dig out, and yeah. it's going to be really in some ways hard to find it's got electrical interference there's so there's a bunch to learn about how to mitigate and and for the professional world to say hey you know when you're dealing with smaller avalanches maybe it's not such a big concern but when there's class three class four avalanches happening in the backcountry in many areas maybe it's not a great day to be out with your side by side so you and know, i think that there's that, a lot of knowledge I think there's a lot of uh, also just the idea that you're saying the class one and class two might not be a big deal for you. But when the side by sides are usually on these trail systems that go cliffside or go mountainside where it's been mm-hmm. burned out and, and there's been erosion and whatnot. So, um, you know, that class one, while it may seem silly, uh, could take you by the tracks and just push you that little bit over the ledge. Yeah. And while the avalanche may have stopped right there at that trail, uh, you might be down 100 feet from that at that oh, point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and at that point, like, maybe you're not buried in the machine, but now your machine's bent up and wrapped around a bunch of trees. And and in the snow, those big tanks, they uh, they don't come out that easy. No. So winches, no winches, uh, uh, it's going to be a real big challenge to recover your $40,000 unit. And, and there's a big uh, issue with communication and tracking and all that as well. So when you guys are out, you know, on the sleds and whatnot, you, um, some of the big things that you're concerned about are communication between you and your team, communication out mm-hmm. to an emergency contact if something were to happen and the ability to find somebody if they get buried right so can you speak Correct. a little bit to kind of how you guys approach that well so right now in the ski snowboard snowmobile world we use things called avalanche transceivers and they work on a 457 megahertz radio frequency and even, like yesterday i was teaching a course where a guy was carrying a cell phone and that cell phone got too close to his transceiver gave it a bunch of electrical interference and uh, confused the transceiver, which then he wasn't able to accomplish the goal in the uh, in the rescue scenario. So the side by sides will be full of those electrical uh, problems as well, with Bluetooth and all those sorts of issues. So as the sport develops and makes exposures, uh, it almost might be the first industry that needs to develop another way of tracking where where somebody might be completely buried and you can't see the unit out of the snow and uh, being able to deal with it that way. So uh, rescue it with those units. And we deal with that in Canada quite a bit where, you know, we have a semi truck on the highway. We didn't forecast the problem, right? We didn't shoot it down with a gun or a howitzer or a bomb. And then all of a sudden the trailer or the truck and trailer get hit on the highway and it's buried. They're very hard to find. Um, so you basically go what, like you would, you'd see in that Turkish footage and you got these big long sticks and you're probing around just to hit the unit. You know, let alone, let's say somebody just getting out and talking with their friends and uh, and they don't realize what's above them. And all of a sudden, a, a, a natural or let's say a snowmobile triggered avalanche because the snowmobilers are above you and use the same access. And all of a sudden it hits you and you're out of your machine. You're really, really now a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So it's there's a lot to learn about mitigating the the, the problem. So in the side-by-side world, uh, if you're out on tracks, typically the scenario is that you've gotten a full cab enclosure, uh, you've got a heater running. Uh, typically, mm-hmm. I would say 90% of the people running audio systems are doing it via Bluetooth. Um, and uh, you have the machine itself, you have the cage, you have all the electronics, you have the Bluetooth, um, you have anything that, like, as far as everybody in the car having cell phones, all with 
whatever radio is running at, off of those guys. Um, and a lot of times they're in like a roaming mode, right? So they're hitting all the frequencies. They're trying to find all the signal they can possibly mm-hmm. find. Um, and they'll use all the battery they can to do that too. So they're not like holding back. They're not trying to be power efficient. They're, they're pushing those radios to yeah. the limits. And uh, when you combine that all within a steel cage, right, you're, you're creating a disaster just for radio communications in general. And a lot of those guys don't even have like uh, VHF radios or anything like that. Um, mm-hmm. And so uh, if we were to talk about going into the backcountry prepared, right, um, on, a, on a sledder, you're going to be talking about those transceivers and you're going to be talking about having some sort of radio to talk back and forth and then probably some sort of satellite comm to send a text message mm-hmm. or an emergency beacon, right? Um, if you mm-hmm. were to approach a side-by-side uh, rider, how would you approach, uh, what kind of comms would you recommend that they go out uh, into the snow with? Because I and, and I want to get into the rest of it as well, but I think that's the first step, right? People get prepared to go out. What are they putting in their car to be able to communicate to the outside world if the worst were to happen? Oh yeah, so there's an assortment of things out there that are very, uh, very cheap and affordable. You know, see that big scar on my head? <laughs> you know that you just don't get that resolution and get professional rescue without having outside communication. It's hard to call a helicopter in if somebody breaks a femur or those sorts of things. And uh, the best way to do it, I think, at this point is two-way communication is either with an in-reach or a global star unit. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, for me, the in-reach works on the Iridium satellite network, which is what the U.S. military uses. Global Star is a recreationally-based company, and sometimes maybe they have issues with their systems. And... Uh, you know, one of their satellites falls out of the air. For me, I think the Iridium network is pretty much the, the um, how do you say, it? the most consistent without issues. But so Spot works on the Global Star network and Reach works on the Iridium network. And uh, there's some so many products coming out there at this point that uh, there's a bivy being made out of Salt Lake City, which allows your Bluetooth phone to communicate and text with the outside world. And that costs you $20 a month. And if you're in the backcountry, I think you're absolutely crazy not to have that in your machine. Um, anywhere from heart attacks to avalanches to any sort of injury gives you the ability to ask somebody to make a phone call, call 911 or have some sort of help. Um, and, and that's this a stuff, mandatory. Yeah, this stuff even pertains to what we do backcountry riding during the summertime. You know, we go out in such remote areas of Idaho, you know, you're, you're in a bad, bad spot if you don't if you're not prepared for the worst. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it's that it's crazy not to to be out there without that sort For sure. of equipment. And then moving into having comms between your two your two machines, you know, my machine was set up with uh, aviation comms, uh, so we had headsets to keep the noise out and all that sort of stuff. Right? Um, there's an assortment of Bluetooth options out there to communicate with inside the unit, um, but how how do you communicate to somebody that's five six kilometers away? Right. And that really comes down to like an assortment of products of VHF, UHF radio systems are the most tried and true proven system to cover huge amounts of ground. And legally uh, in the U S you're only allowed a five and, uh, and that's your Garmin's uh, that give you GPS location as well. So that's kind of nice to have a Garmin that gives the location of, so Zach's over here and Jeremy's over here. But we also can pull our locations and see where we are on a map in real time. Uh, super handy way to keep track of one another. And about a $600 unit, but you can actually have a mic on it. So it's like a CB mic and uh, you can have it mounted on your dash quite easily. Uh, that's definitely something I would be carrying to communicate with the other units. Um, kind of hard to hear over some of the noise in, in the units. So uh, I don't know if anybody's really designed a good quality comp. You could plug that into a headset and a few other things, but uh, if you get inventive, there's a lot of product out there to uh, to amplify the uh, the mic and a few other things, or or putting into into a headset so it's quick communication. Yeah, there's a there's a um, you know there's been a need for gear like that for so long, and it seemed to develop here in the states. You you, you mentioned Garmin, where I noticed it was in the hunting community. You know, guys would uh, mm-hmm. go out hunting, and they'd use these Garmins where they could keep track of their buddies, and they could co- kind of coordinate where they're hiking towards in the mountains. But yeah, I mean, in the off road community, I think uh, it's it's something that's been needed for a long time. I've noticed that uh, I've noticed that Trail Tech 
has developed some. I don't know if it piggybacks on the on the uh, uh, Polaris software, the uh, Ride Command software, but you can keep track of your buddies. You can see where they're at in real time so long as you're within about eight miles of each other. Right, so. and the new Ride Command on the Polaris uh, Pro XP, uh, it'll actually go into a cell based off of a cell tower based off the machines it'll use the machine as the cell tower and broadcast oh interesting um, and that's how they're doing machine to machine tracking is that the each machine becomes a little mini cell tower that they can talk to each other so that's pretty cool oh, wow. um uh, but that requires everybody to be on the same page, right? Yeah. And, and, and we all know that 95, 96% of everybody that drives together has different machines and different budgets and all that stuff. So, um, Jeremy, if, if someone's looking to go in the backcountry and they've got these tracks and want to go exploring, um, what are some of the resources, websites that they could go to to see if there is even avalanche-like conditions that they could be worried about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so great. Like, pretty much every state in the U.S., and like I said, I've, doing, I've been doing talks all over the U.S., and then traveled and rode all over uh of north america with a snowmobile everybody has an avalanche bulletin system some are better than others uh depending on what state you're in but you can go like for idaho there's uh the idaho panhandle association i believe it's called um that produces an avalanche bulletin maybe you guys can look a few of these up there's the northwest avalanche center in in yeah, in washington there's the utah avalanche center colorado avalanche center uh, so every state has a center that is producing somewhat of a bulletin. They all have different qualities, but really gives you a uh, preparedness to what sort of avalanche problem you're trying to mitigate. And the bulletins also to use them, you kind of have to have some base understanding about avalanche train. So, you know, maybe there is an actual market here to start developing some avalanche awareness and mitigation tactics for the side-by-side -side community as it enters into into avalanche terrain. Right. And when you get those resources, like you said, you kind of have to know what the terminology is. You have to understand what the difference is between the different types of conditions uh, and how they mm -hmm. impact your ability to ride through them or around them or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of maybe go into just a real basic, uh, quick like primer on the different types of avalanche conditions and, and how to recognize maybe a couple of the key, more common scenarios? Well, yeah, and how it you know it affects like let's say the side by side community. In most cases, the side by side guys, you know, with the wrist avalanches, it's going to be from an avalanche from way above them that comes down and hits a road access that they're on, right. kind of like our highway system. So we worry about the larger class three avalanche traveling down a mountain and and your unit being parked or stopped with it above, it, you know, really increases your hazard. So it's knowing to look for like trim lines and the trees and a few things like that, that say that avalanche is frequent here. Um, and, you know, being able to read the bulletin and say in the bulletin, if they talked about a Northeast aspect producing class three avalanches naturally triggered and your road network travels underneath that North aspect. And what does aspect mean? So if the mountains are shaped like this and this direction is North, that slope is North facing that alone helps you mitigate or actually have the situational awareness that northeast aspects could actually have a large class three avalanche come down them naturally. And maybe that's not the right route to be on that day. Right. That alone with that simple knowledge helps you mitigate it um, and recognize that risk is out there. And knowing what, what uh, faces are, are prone to an issue at that point also helps, helps you plan out your trip. A lot of times as, as side-by-side -side riders, we go out, we just know we're going to an area. We don't necessarily know what trail we're going to go down or which, uh, which system we're going to take all the way through to a certain point. We just know we're going out to have fun and we're going to hit the trail mm -hmm. the way we kind of just feel the direction take the wind takes us. Right. Um, and in the summer, that's usually fine. Uh, but in the winter, there's a lot more to take into consideration when you're talking about getting from point A to point B. And I think, like you said, knowing which aspects uh, are going to be prone to issues uh, can help you reduce the chance of you getting into a situation that could be deadly or even potentially, um, you know, uh, a, a huge issue for the group. So um, it, I've never really planned those trail rides to that point of saying, you know, we're going to go around this way because of a uh, issue here. But uh, when we're talking about winter, I could definitely see uh, that being a point that people need to take the time to do and say, the weather conditions are these. This has been known to happen this week. We need to make sure we're staying on this side of the system or that taking this route because that that turnoff is going to take us up the chute or whatever. That's not going to be uh, a safe way to go. 
And, and that's and that's how we work too on the base understanding. You know, sure we make probably a lot more exposure to to the problem, but it's actually for a side by side a lot easier to mitigate the issue because of what you're doing. It's just a bit of knowledge gives you the ability to avoid it in your trip plan. And yeah, sure you turn down a road most times, but you still understand that road's headed south and up in elevation. And uh, as you go up in elevation. And you're looking at your topographic map or you got your Google Earth on on your phone. And really, you can just learn a lot from Google Earth where these larger class three avalanches might hit your road. Like, you know, you look at Google Earth and you're, you're traveling through and all there's you're in this forest and all of a sudden the forest isn't there anymore for 500 feet. And then there's then you look at Google Earth and you look up the mountain in elevation. You're like, wow, there's like a big start zone and that's where avalanches happen. Yeah. So now it's understanding what aspect that start zone is. And it's a lot like for ice climbers. When we communicate with ice climbers, they don't, they, they're in the alpine, you know, the higher elevations of the mountains. They expose themselves on that ice for 15 hours as they climb. And, uh, you know, they don't have a lot of way to run away from the avalanche. So they really want to understand what could naturally trigger an avalanche on a south aspect that they're going to expose to 15 minutes or 15 hours. Side-by-siders are just going to travel through it and really that minimizes your exposure. But if you park underneath it, that's parking in a run out and that's a dumb decision. So it's being able to recognize it. And a lot, a lot of times as, as guys that are going out into the, the mountains like this, we stop in those areas for pitchers and for a, a mm-hmm. drink and for whatever. It's really common to do that. That's not necessarily uncommon. I would say it's pretty frequent, actually, that you uh, take the time to get out, stretch your legs, get a drink, get a snack, take a picture with the family, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And those scenic areas are, unless you're at the very, very top, are typically prone to avalanches because of the fact that they're clear. They have a slab. Mm -hmm. that can come down and um you know we talk about here in the northwest a lot about fires and and burnouts and things like that where you know there at one point there was a system of trees or vegetation that would hold the base layer in place right um Mm -hmm. or like rock systems that would be in place under power lines or whatever uh and uh during the winter when that's all gone and it's burned through that summer you now have a new hazard that wasn't there before and um you know, an avalanche isn't uh, triggered because all the snow from the top down to the dirt decided to start moving. It's because no. there's different layers of snow, correct, that have correct. different um, shear points. And those shear mm-hmm. points can be triggered by weight or by vibration or by pressure from above or, or whatever, mm-hmm. right? So uh, something you said earlier was <clears throat> um, the possibility of having an avalanche triggered by a sledder above you or by something happening mm-hmm. above you. And when you're out riding, you're never once considering is anybody above us? Like that's never even mm-hmm. in your head. And in the, in the summertime, it's because usually there are obstacles in the way that require us to, to not have to worry about that. Like there's going to be stuff up there that just no one's going to be up there unless they're hiking or, or walking or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to be doing that that far out in the woods. So, uh, mm-hmm. In the winter, though, you have sled machines, you have um, guys on tracks, you have uh, just road maintenance guys or service guys or, you know, helicopters. Helicopter skiing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All that kind of stuff. And it's very possible that if you're in an opening, that's where the skiers want to go. That's where sledders want to go do their, mm-hmm. their side hilling, things like that. So um, definitely it's something to take into consideration that most people won't even have a clue to think about um, in those conditions. So if you're, if you're going out into these areas uh, – we're talking about the clearing areas, but is it is it true or not true that if you're in the trees, you're safe? Well, in some way, it depends on how thick the trees are. First, you look at avalanches love anything that's 30 to 45 degrees. And, uh, and anything underneath that 30 down to 20, they're kind of infrequent. And you got to remember, however tall that 30 to 45 degrees is that's above you, is a rough rule of thumb is how far it can go to hit you. And um, so just because you're underneath it is actually that you're in the danger zone. You'd have to be a long ways around the bottom of it. So if something's a thousand vertical feet tall at 30 to 45 degrees, you need to be roughly a thousand feet away from it on the bottom, on the flat portion of the slope to avoid where it can hit you. And, um, and then we start looking at ground cover. Sure, heavily forested areas that are 30 to 45 degrees you know, it's, it's not dangerous. It's well anchored. The snowpack's quite a bit different. But when you get into sparsely spaced trees like burns and stuff like that, the snowpack is 
developing differently than where it is where it's primarily you know quality vegetation and not burnt so yeah things are changing it takes a bit of knowledge to assess that um and it's it's really cool to see because i think you guys are on the lead of your culture as it develops and uh being a part of a lot of cultures, I was part of the early snowboarders that influxed the backcountry in the early 90s and now into the snowmobiling industry. And then even the snow bikes create their own issues and uh, now side by side. So uh, it really starts with uh, avalanche awareness and the knowledge. And it really becomes very easy to mitigate if you have knowledge and really reduce your risks. Yeah. One of the challenges I've noticed in side by sides is I'll go out riding with uh basic basically new riders that consider themselves to be pretty good drivers and without fail they're on their lid i gotta imagine that that's pretty difficult in um in snowmobiling like we were talking earlier the first machine i ever threw a leg over was about 90 horsepower they're probably closer nowadays on the 800s to being 190 than they are to 90 so the machine is just infinitely capable just like a side-by-side and guys will get a little overconfident in their ability and like uh, is that a problem that you've noticed it's kind of hard to educate people about those things oh oh yeah completely they're riding ferraris you know and uh right now skidoo just came out with a stock turbo that's for sale right now people are purchasing with 165 horse no matter what elevation you're at quite tunable to 200 horse like that so well, I'm going to go to uh, yeah, the Skidoo it, dealer it, after this. So. <laughs> it, it creates a whole other problem. And uh, it takes knowledge, and the knowledge needs to match the, the, the equipment and the user. And, and that's where you guys are at. And I, I can see it coming right now. I can see a side-by-side accident in an avalanche in the near future. No and, and not that I'm not a side-by-sider. I have one. I built one. Uh, and I'm an avid backcountry user. Uh, with a lot of avalanche knowledge and yeah i put them in avalanche train i i put one in with 50 horse in it in 2010 i had it up sail mountain had it exposed to a massive class three avalanche issue i was climbing around in the start zone area of it with the with the machine so they're really capable to find you some serious trouble and sure it might take a larger avalanche to really bury you and maybe suffocate you to death but um, it can also hurt you rolling around or damage your machine. Even if, like Zach said, I think brought up a really good point that, you know, that thing pushes you off the road and it pushes you a hundred feet down the edge of that 40 degree slope into the trees. It's not like recovering it in the summer. <laughs> right. Uh, it's going to be a lot more work. Yeah. I've done that on a motorcycle and they're infinitely right. easier to get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when you're talking about, uh, going off the side of the road, um, one thing that people don't realize or maybe just don't consider is the fact that even if you're in a fully enclosed machine, um, those aren't tanks. Those aren't, you know, quarter inch mm-hmm. steel walls, right? Yeah. And the tree's not going to move. You're going to move or that door is mm-hmm. going to move or that window is going to move. Yep. And a lot of these enclosures that the guys in the snow are using are, you know, uh, like canvas zip ups Fabric. with vinyl um, windows and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, when you're talking about, yeah, I mean, it's possible that I could go over the edge. It's not that you're just going over the edge. It's that you're tumbling down uh, yep. basically a, a pin cushion of needles and, and things that can yep. impact you, take you out, oh, take yeah. a limb off, um, pierce your, your organs, things like that. And when you're, when you're traveling at speed upside down on your side, whatever it is, um, you know, you have no options. You are basically confined to whatever restraint system you have, if you're wearing it and, mm-hmm. um, you know, holding your arms in and praying to God that something doesn't hit you on the way through. So, um, yeah. Uh, we've seen in the summertime um, a lot of issues over the last year or two of people being impaled by branches that come through firewalls or Ooh. through uh, floor panels or whatever, yeah. um, going through their legs, going through their abdomens, things like that. Um, and while that seems like, well, that'll never happen to me, it almost happened to me this last year. And then um, mm-hmm. uh, when you're talking about the possibility of being in a, in a an emergency wreck situation, um, your your potential for that kind of stuff just goes through the roof. Um, and so mm-hmm. it's a re- it's a very real danger that people don't consider or don't like to admit. I think there's a lot of that. I think there's yeah. a, there's a lot of uh, stubbornness in us as uh, power sports enthusiasts that we say, mm-hmm. um, I, if I ignore the danger, I'm not scared by the danger, and if I'm not scared by the danger, I'm not going to wreck. 
yeah ignorance is bliss right right and and yeah and like even me i feel like oh you guys are in these machines but man you bring up some great points you know the fabric all the rest of it that these guys have on is not sufficient uh you know an avalanche will just rip that right through that you know a, a class three avalanche would easily destroy a wood framed house blow your house apart right a class two is enough to easily bury or kill you and uh and can have ten thousand metric tons of snow in a class three class two a thousand metric tons of snow so uh and a class one's 10 metric tons of snow wow so it's it's a fair amount of volume of snow moving down down the slope and it's uh and it it it's rock hard it's heavy it does damage right it's, it's compacting it the whole <laughs> way down it's not staying fluffy <laughs> I got caught in a class three. When it hit me, it was I was on the bottom part of the slide when it hit us. A couple guys put a line over our heads. And when it hit me, it hit me like a freight train. And when I got my snowmobile out of there, it was opened up like a tin can. It looked like a soup can. The motor was ripped out of it. You know, it was completely destroyed. It would destroy your side by side. You wouldn't have any tracks on it. The motor would be out. It would be your steering column would be ripped apart. You know, it's uh, it's very powerful. And uh, when you it, let's just talk about a hypothetical situation of being buried, right? Let's just say you were on the lower trail system, something had triggered above you, buried you. Uh, let's just pretend like nothing really dangerously happened as far as going off of a cliff or being uh, rolled down a hillside or anything, but you were buried, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. let's just say you're 10 feet down. Um, if someone has like a, uh, a normal VHF radio system in their rig, uh, is that mm. going to get out of that snow is cause I mean, Oh yeah. Like, yeah, if you're, if you're buried, like the car gets buried, like, we, and we've seen all these same accidents happen on highway systems with machines similar to it. And yeah, a VHF radio is going to get its radio frequency out and you can warn somebody that you've been buried by an avalanche a hundred percent great tool to have. Like if, you know, if That's you have unnecessary. a ham license, you can, you can go buy uh, if you have a ham license or you can buy one that's programmed to the certain channels you want and, and put in a, 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 you know, a 40 watt system into your uh, into your rig. Like we carry like eight watt systems on our backs, but a rig has infinite power and you could have you can get 20 miles of range out of a 40 watt radio system. So, yeah, totally. Now, and it's with... gonna, you're going to be able to call for help to the other rigs that are maybe not in line of sight. Now, with, with radio waves, you know, water is the enemy of radio. And when that water is in snow form on top of you, um, you're talking about, you know, a high output uh, radio. Is not is a handheld 5 watt, 8 watt going to do it? Uh, yeah, it totally. It will get through. And uh, like I, when I'm doing at practice scenarios and I try to make it fun, I bury my radio in my bag and try talking to people through it while they're looking on the surface of the snow. I've been buried. I can... You know, I was I was six feet deep, seven feet deep, and uh, and I could hear the the conversation going on on the surface above me, just slightly it mumbles. Mm -hmm. But now, like I'll I'll bury a backpack a meter. Well, speaking American terms, probably you know six seven feet. I'll bury the backpack with the radio, and I'll talk from another radio to it, and kind of make the the scenario very realistic. Um, yeah, and you could yell in your unit, but when I was buried, I'd. Uh, a snow plug all the way down my throat yelling right. just wasn't really an option but you know in a in a in a rig you could yell if you're buried too deep yeah sure it muffles your sounds but uh i think a, a radio system would help you get out for sure and and you're crazy anyways just not to have a big 40 watt radio because your buddy's still in the parking lot and he's coming out late to the game right you can communicate with them and they're inexpensive so when we're talking about being buried uh, in a personal like snowmobile scenario, you're being thrown off your machine and you are the only thing that is like you're not connected to anything at that point. You are buried as a human under the slab of mm -hmm. snow. Um, and there are, you know, basically no options for you as far as movement, right? You can't, I mean, unless you're like, you have your AV pack on and all that other stuff to create air pockets around you, um, you're not going to have the option to really move or to even breathe. And sometimes mm -hmm. if you breathe out, you're letting more snow in, right? And, and compressing your body in a machine, let's just say best hypothetical scenario, you're in your machine surrounded by snow, um, and you have your cabin space. Uh, let's just say you have a perfect scenario where you're just you have this this pocket of air that you're in. Um, is there mm -hmm. even an option for you to dig out at that point? 
<laughs> uh, well, there is. Yeah. You know, like this has happened in the past in cars and uh, where people have lived days and days inside their in their machines. Because what really kills 75 percent of avalanche victims is that we die by asphyxiation. So what that means is carbon monoxide poisoning. We create our own tomb around our mouth and we keep breathing and breathing until the carbon dioxide kills us. And that usually happens within 15 minutes. Um, in most cases, after 15 minutes, you have a 50% chance of survival. So is the rough old numbers. But back in the day when we were pushing highways through avalanche train and stuff, we would hit cars and people live days. And, uh, so yeah, if your rig doesn't get smashed in and a bunch of snow fill inside of it and you got room to move, people have crawled and clawed their way back up through and out. Do you, do you think that scenario would be better to try to escape or to let, let's just say that you can't communicate for whatever reason, whether that mm -hmm. the comm system goes out or you've been sitting there for a day, is it better to sit there and try to make that work? Or is it better to claw out and try to assume that you're only four feet, five feet, whatever the case is down? I, I would try to escape yeah. I, in my personal thought pattern, especially if I, there was no line of sight, nobody knows the rigs hit. There's two people in it you have a volume of space to move the snow that you're shoveling out that you're trying to tunnel out. Yeah. I'm getting out. Yeah. Uh, Cause otherwise you're just going to actually become hypothermic. And even though it'll keep the heat to your body, you're going to starve. You're left missing water, all those sorts of things. You're really buried alive with movement. Gotcha. Um, it's almost in some ways worse than, than my burial. Right. Because it, it, you'd be in an insane asylum. Uh, I would, uh, I would start clawing my way out if I could move that snow into a location. And, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd start pushing and making room to try to figure my way out. So uh, before I jump into, uh, you know, the whole education side of it uh, and where people can go, um, just real quick, uh, if, you, if someone finds themselves in a situation where they are in an avalanche scenario, um, what are some key takeaways to put back in that subconscious memory that you can then, you know, like some key points that you can re you can just as long as you follow some certain rules that you're going to have the best chance of survival or even help helping someone else survive. So, well, yeah, so getting away from the mitigation, having knowledge and uh, and the ability to know where avalanches are happening in the backcountry by using your the, the local bulletin system. And let's say something did bad happen to you. I, I would be carrying right now. The, the transceivers would be a uh, struggle to put in the unit uh, because of all the electrical interference that exists in them. Um, but it's plausible. We could talk about that. But the first thing I would start carrying is a probe. <laughs> so, you know, if I came across and my other, uh, you know, companion or unit got caught and it's buried and I can't see it, I need to find it. And the best way is a long stick called a probe. And then you can probe and ting, ting, ting. Metal feels like metal. Rocks feel like rocks, you know, the fabric casing feels like fabric. And I would be able to find it that way. And, uh, and if my friend that was watching from a distance saw my machine get hit, at least he has some sort of tool to know exactly where it is. And so he can dig exactly there. Um, being caught in, in, in the machine itself, uh, I'd be thinking about, uh, you know, having a small shovel, <laughs> like even the avalanche shovels that you could dig out of the machine and start moving snow around without clawing your fingers red and raw. A lot of the guys um, in the off-road world will take those little military collapsible type shovels and they'll put them behind their seat yeah. or whatever. Um, even perfect. that would be perfect to get out of a situation, right? Totally. And feasible and economical to carry in the machine without too much taking up too much space of it. And yeah, that's a, that's a great tool to have on board. Um, so what about like the mental space? Like what are some of the things like in an emergency, uh, uh, first responder is going to say, you know, stay calm, stay collected, try to breathe, all that kind of stuff. But as far as avalanche mm -hmm. goes, are there some takeaways that people could have? Like, okay, my first, my first step in recovering my buddy or my first step in, you know, figuring out how to get out of this if I'm half buried or whatever the case is, are there some mental, uh, takeaways that people could have in that scenario? <coughs> Well, if you're on the surface of the snow and you watch your friend get married, buried, yeah, like you need to calm down for sure. But the other thing you need to do is assess it. Is it safe? Uh, right now in northern Canada, two days ago, a snowmobiler got caught not wearing an avalanche transceiver. And his friends didn't know how to find him. 
the search and rescue teams are in there right now, but it wasn't safe, so they had to remove a thing called hang fire with bombs. So sometimes when avalanches come off the mountain, they leave some snow up there, which is also dangerous. So if you're on the surface, you need to have the skill set and say, well, is there a secondary avalanche that could come down and hit me? And that's killed a lot of people, secondary avalanches. That's what happens in Turkey. That's what happened in northern Canada right now. That's what they, that killed the Harvey 8 in Sparling. Um, was a secondary avalanche. So uh, you need to be able to assess that problem before you actually go in and keep calm on the surface. And no, like there's fairly, like I'm speaking out of just personal experience without any, because this is a new sport, but in the car world, there's a good chance there's an air pocket and you have time to manage this and, uh, and to help somebody get out. So staying calm, being able to probe and, and, and assess the situation and know where the machine is, is the next real big step. If you're in the machine, yeah, you know, having a shovel is going to make you feel warm and fuzzy, especially when there's room. So it's about that pre-planning, and that's going to keep you uh, feeling super positive uh, that you have an, uh, a response plan here. I think one of the biggest things that uh, guys forget to do uh, is to communicate to the outside world where they're going to be, you know, what time mm-hmm. to expect them to be back, those types of scenarios. And when, when you're going out on the trail system uh, in the summertime, just somebody knowing that you're going out is usually enough. But the fact that you're in the winter conditions, possible avalanche conditions, uh, possible getting stuck, running out of gas, you know, things like that. Um, if you let somebody know that you're going on this trail system, we're going to be headed mostly west and all that kind of stuff. Just so that somebody knows uh, half the battle is knowledge, right? Like like uh, recovery efforts and survival uh, experts will usually say, that little piece of knowledge is usually what separates somebody living and dying. And mm-hmm. um, so uh, when we go out and we go on these adventures, uh, telling the person that's staying home or the buddy that's staying home or the buddy that had to go to work and kind of go with you or whatever, just say, hey, we're going out. I just want to let you know we're going to be taking the East Trail system up to uh, the Wolf Cabin or whatever the case is. And so that at least somebody has some sort of indication of where you're going to be so that if something were to happen, it's nine o'clock at night, you still haven't communicated with anybody. People are starting to get concerned. Um, you know, that person can say, Hey, I can reach out. I have this little bit of knowledge. I don't know if it's going to help, but it may be the thing that makes the difference. Oh, it's something I do every day, even with all the electrical equipment today. You know, I, I don't have a plug in on the machine or anything else to charge stuff. So every day, uh, uh, a dispatcher knows where I'm going, who's in my group, how many people, and exactly where I'm going. Not roughly, exactly where I'm going and what time to expect my call. And if I don't call by 9 p.m. that night in the spring, then they go down a call list of my friends to come hunt for me. That's good planning. And because you can't always depend on the electronics, and it's something I do every day to, the, to where I'm at today, even with all that equipment. Um, because I've done the mistakes. I've been back there and nobody knowing where I am and having to spend the night in summer or winter. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Like a guy died last year out, out here on Boulder that uh, nobody really knew where he is. He, ne- he never called his sister. It was a couple days later and he just got turned around. Um, man, he was like uh, in American terms, not even a mile from the Boulder cabin and uh, dug a snow cave and snow caves don't really work. That's you got to know how to actually have winter survival skills and keep your body warm and all the rest of it. And your machine goes dead and the battery quits or your electrical system. And that's the only thing you were depending on. And now it's just you and a friend. I, I've done the night in a, in a snow and a proper Quincy. And I'm, I'm glad I knew how to build one because it was cold and it was a horrible experience. And hypothermia is a very real thing. And, uh, and people die from it all the time. So, yeah, having a dispatcher or somebody at home that knows what to do and where you're at. Uh, every day I do that. Yeah. I, you just touched on it. Like in the business world, I say this all the time that, uh, you know, having the right tools and having the right plan provides you with a comfort level, but knowing how to use it is even just as valuable, if not more valuable. So you can have, you can have the shovels, you can have the probes, you can have every piece of equipment known to man, but that's just scratching the surface of, you know, it's good to, to do some sort of training similar to what you're doing. And it's, you know, that applies to so much of what we're doing from a riding standpoint, whether it be in the snow, whether it be in the mountains, anything like that, survival situations, you know, what to do when you get into trouble. But uh, yeah, I, I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah. Re- remote areas like that, what that these machines get us to, they get us further, deeper and further back, which is harder for 
you know, our volunteer based, even in the U S search and rescue teams to come help you. You are responsible for your own well being. For sure. And, uh, and I didn't get here because I got it right. I got here because I got lucky and I made a ton of mistakes and I, I've spent the night in the bush in the middle of the winter. I've done overnights in the summer. You know, I, I do a lot of remote hiking in the summertime and, uh, and I access it with a side by side and then I go up to a crazy cool lake or whatever else. But somebody always knows where I am and I have the skills to survive, not just, you know, the equipment, but the actual skills and the knowledge and that's what goes a long way is uh, is that knowledge to making you feel comfortable that you can spend the night. Otherwise, your head starts spinning around and lots of problems start happening. Yeah. So when we start so, talking about that education and knowing what that uh, what that whole experience looks like, right? Uh, in a general sense, if you're going in the snow at all uh, for any kind of adventure, you should have some sort of survival understanding of if I'm stuck out here in the snow, what are my basic core concepts that are going to keep me alive? Um and is there any kind of resource that you could speak of that would help people start down that path? Oh, yeah, man. You know, what's crazy is, you know, you used to have to hire an electrician to wire your house. Now you can almost teach yourself it on YouTube. Right. So, yeah, there's a ton of winter survival content out there on YouTube that you can start with. There's a ton of actual winter survival courses out there. Uh, if you wanted to pay to actually have somebody instruct you and you physically do it. Um, sourcing winter survival tactics on YouTube is a great start. Um, there's a bunch of mountaineering schools that do avalanche or sorry, not avalanche, but winter survival programs. Uh, and then it gives you the ability to know what you need to have on your unit and to be prepared for those situations. And then not just the equipment, but the skills to actually implement it. And I'll tell you right now, I can spend the night and not worry about it, but I could, you know, have somebody like I was out at four in the morning the other day. I just taught this guy in a course last night. I had to go out at four in the morning and recover a group of snowmobilers from the middle of nowhere. They were hypothermic. They built a fire. They thought they were going to live because they had a big fire and fuel. Four in the morning, three of them were hypothermic and barely, their hands are blue. They're getting frostbite. No skill set. They thought this big fire was going to solve the problem for them. Well, it doesn't quite work that no. way. So, you know, and now they're all like, okay, well, now I want to learn more after the fact. Don't do it after the fact, because if you know what you're doing out there, you can have a nice, comfortable evening. You're not terrified that you're going to die. Okay, still kind of uncomfortable. These guys, because they didn't have that knowledge, almost died. And, uh, and if it wasn't, it wasn't search and rescue, because search and rescue would have never took the risks to get them out. The only thing that they had was a direct number to me, <laughs> yeah, just because I happened to know a girl in the group. And I think, and, I think uh, we need to invite Jeremy well, out on our Idaho run. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, I mean, that, that group got super lucky, just the fact that, that they had their number, but also that the phone worked. Um, and yeah, able... well, they had an in-reach. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and here's the other thing about learning from their mistake, is that they had two girls, and, and th this happens to a lot of mountain snowmobilers, where they go from somebody that's been following taillights and, and having a mentorship of a better rider but then now it's like, that guy's not available. So they go out, they've got pretty good riding skills, but now they've got a group of people following them and things melted down on them. And the guys didn't want to admit fault. So they didn't want the girls to message anybody. But around midnight, when they weren't getting their way out, one of the girls stole the in reach oh, no. and messaged me. Wow. And gave me but, but she also knew that I needed their radio frequency she knew the in-reach would give me their location. She knew that I needed to know if there was any first aid that needed to be done. If they needed fuel or tools, she gave me all that information in one message before their in-reach died. Wow. So as, if she as, wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have found them without as, that uh, radio free. Stubborn, she might have saved their life. <laughs> as stubborn guys, a lot of times we will, like you just said, they, we won't admit that uh, we did something wrong or that we're in a situation because of our decision. Um, and, uh, in, when you're, you know, in the dirt and you went up the wrong rock face and you now you have to figure out how to get it turned around. That's one thing to not have to admit, but when you're in a situation of life and death and the possibility of impacting other people's lives, um, you know, the, the, there's a certain level of honesty you have to have with yourself and those you're with and humility. Um, and it's always better to be more proactive than to reactive on it. Um, and, uh, there's just going to be, and then, and just this, to say what you were talking about, the education part, like I don't go camping without setting my tent up first to know how it goes together and make sure all the parts are there. Right. Um, 
Mm-hmm. To, to to know how to do something is one thing, but to actually have practiced it at least once is a whole different concept. And uh, like you were saying, you know that you can go out. You know you can survive overnight. Uh, the reason you know that is because you've done it. Like whether that was by mm-hmm. accident or on purpose, uh, it doesn't matter because the whole point is if you don't do something, you don't have the actual in-practice experience to be able to pull it off. And let alone if you're in an emergency system and you would no longer have the use of an arm or the, you can't walk around or whatever the case may be. If you know that there's a certain way to survive, but you can't travel 50 feet to that thing that's going to help you survive, that's a whole different world. It's a whole different scenario. And unless you've tried doing what you know you're supposed to do, you're not going to have the experience and knowledge and the mindset and the calmness, the peace of mind to be able to calm down, do the thing and implement it. Or let alone like just even a medical emergency in the back country and knowing where to go to get a helicopter to you is a skill set. Right. You know, if you got somebody with a broken femur or a broken arm, which I've been in these positions and it's, it's not a simple solution. So, oh, you hit the SOS on your in reach and now search and rescue is coming. But search and rescue is going to come there, assess the situation you're in, and then respond. But if you message to somebody what your situation is and what it gives them an idea of preparedness that speeds the process up. If you realize that, you know, that helicopter is going to need a long line to extract your victim. Well, that, that's a big, huge time savings, right? Because... Now they fly in, they come look over and they say, well, okay, this is the situation. We're going to have to fly back down the valley, land, get our long line systems out, do a bunch of things. Now we need a long line expert and we're going to have to put somebody in the bottom of that line to extract. If you need that long line or, or just actually knowing that you can move your victim to a spot where a helicopter can recover from. And, and what does the helicopter need? Where can they land? What can they do? Um, or, or are you accessible by a, a search and rescue team with a side by side? Um, you got, you know, that communication and understanding goes a long way for that golden hour in first day. You know, it's, uh, I was, uh, <clears throat> I, like I said, I've been through a lot. I was, uh, up a backcountry area, just not near my, not far from my house here, riding with some old clients. And, uh, and I took a risk. I was, uh, I took a jump and I landed funny and I broke my back, but the people I was riding with didn't really understand how to do C-spine control. They didn't understand how to get a hold of the helicopter. They didn't understand how to work my in-reach. They didn't understand how to work my sat phone. So there I am with a broken back doing all of that leadership work while I'm going into, into shock, you know. And, uh, right. and then when the helicopter came in, uh, basically, you know, they didn't know. They thought that the helicopter would see them quite easily, but that wasn't that easy. So pen flaring the helicopter in, communicating, you know, the, luckily I had given the helicopter my radio frequency. So... You know, that goes a, a, a long way to having those understandings. Yeah, being prepared for an extraction is a whole different concept uh, that very, very few people even understand what why that's different uh, versus getting yourself out. Um, and there's a lot that goes into, you know, like you're talking about with helis and all that other stuff uh, that most people would just never even like, there would never be a triggered thought to even like, Oh, yeah. If there was a helicopter, what would I need to do? Do I just sit there and Mm -hmm. they tell me what to do? Well, how do they tell you what to do? Like all that stuff comes into play that you would never have any exposure to unless um, you went through the either at least the very minimum, the thought process, let alone the in practice education of uh, the scenarios that would be surrounding that kind of uh, event. So um, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, just the mindset and the preparedness and the education of snow survival. Uh, What kind of process can we go through to be educated on avalanche training and, and recognizing the different sno- the slope types and the, and the shear types and all that kind of stuff? What kind of resources are there available for us to go educate ourselves? Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that overlap in our industry that do sledding, right? There's going to be a lot mm-hmm. of guys that overlap into the backcountry stuff, whether that be hunting, sledding, ATVing, UTVing, uh, all those different things. So there's going to be a really big benefit to them overall, just in the education, but let alone just the avalanche education. What kind of resources can we kind of pursue? Um, and we'll put a lot of this stuff all up on the website with the podcast and all that other stuff that people can click on and go find stuff. Um, but what kind of resources should they be looking for? And what are the different types of education uh, that are available? Well, so I, there's nothing designed for that side by side user that's customized. So you're going right. to have to in today's day and age, you're going to have to jump on some of the, probably the motorized stuff. And, um, 
would a motorized avalanche skills course level one work for you when you're not a snowmobiler? If you're a snowmobiler, you should have that at the bare minimum. But if you're a side-by-sider and that's it, that's pretty tough to go buy a machine and go do that stuff. But what is available to you is I do a bunch of avalanche awareness talks throughout North America. And it gives you a general overview of avalanche terrain and the avalanche problem. Sure, it's not customized to what your use is. But you know what? Pulling that talker off the side of, uh, uh, of the conversation after he's done, he'll help you understand. But even the, that three-hour talk will go a long way for you just to recognize that where the avalanche problem is and, and uh, give you a little bit of ability to avoid it and use some of the, you know, the different avalanche associations communication tactics. And I know uh, that to, you were here locally doing an awareness uh, training at a local dealership where it, was, it wasn't necessarily training per se. It was just the idea that there's things to know and these are the things that you need to know. Um, and mm-hmm. even just that alone, uh, and, and that's what's triggered this conversation that we're having right now is – just that alone let me know enough information that I can identify that there are issues and that I need to be educated on them um, as a, a person that takes people out riding, as a person that goes riding himself, um, and as somebody that's an advocate in our community for safety and, and recreational fun. Um, you know, just even knowing that little tidbit that you gave at that meeting that was completely geared towards snowmobilers, uh, there was enough in that that I came away with enough knowledge that I could go search it, Google it. YouTube it, whatever, uh, and start reaching to those resources to start educating myself a little bit better than than yeah. nothing. Like I was at nothing, right? I knew there was avalanches, but I had no idea about any of it. So like even your dealers, even putting pressure on your dealers, like the, you could hire a guy like me to come do a talk that's orientated exactly towards what, what side-by-siders need to know. As uh, long as you find an avalanche professional, that's what I'm trained to do in Canada. I don't care if you're running a snowcat, a helicopter, a snowmobile, uh, we're trained to mitigate the avalanche problem and custom build programs that will, you know, you know, there's a different problem to a side by side. There's a different problem to a rail car system, you know, like right. uh, uh, we manage avalanche hazards for certain assets and uh, and we're good at it. So, you know, even as the side by side world develops, I think somebody needs to be looking at what side by siders need to know and uh, and building up some sort of content that's focused towards you guys. Um, Because I I see the problem really coming to fruit here soon um, as the machines get better and put you out there more and there's more of you doing it. Yeah, you're uh, talking to a couple guys that'd be happy to develop some of that stuff for sure. Yeah, we're we're big proponents to start pushing things forward. Yeah, and you don't have to talk to me twice about getting me go up to Alberta. No problem. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, like I think that's great. And you know what? Like there's so much terrain out here and I think it's great the a group of guys like you is starting that before there's an accident. And right. in the human nature, it's such a habit of putting up the stop sign after somebody dies. And uh, now I've been a guy that died. They had to resuscitate me. Oh, it wow. sucks. I can tell you what you think about. And you think about your family and all that. You don't really think about your own death. but it, And that's why I'm such a component. I still take high risks, you know. I'll send you guys some pics to throw in your stuff. Like I'm still flipping sleds upside down still push and train, but I've learned to manage those risks at a high level. And, and really what I love about what I do is I'm helping my community do it safely because it is like the native spirit walk. Being in nature is such a beautiful thing and it shouldn't be restricted to the person just walking on their two feet. Uh, it, it's something that we all have the right to roam and experience our backcountry. And, and uh, I like seeing people being able to do it safely and, and come back with near misses, not fatalities. Are there any uh, just avalanche, like generic avalanche educational materials on YouTube or other websites that people could start diving into just to start wetting the appetite of knowledge? Uh, well, you know what? I did, a, I did a, a thing called throttle decisions for snowmobiling, and uh, it's available for free on Vimeo. Um, if you Google throttle decisions Vimeo, it has an outreach component, which is my burial story. And it's based around snowmobiling, but you know what? It has eight educational chapters on how weather makes snowpack. And it talks heavily about start zones and they're little 15 minute pieces and they're free. And it's a great place to start, to start educating you about avalanche terrain. Yeah. And that was kind of what my takeaway was from that uh, awareness meeting that we had, Um, you know, it doesn't matter that it's a different sport. It doesn't matter that it was a person on a machine that they could physically get separated from. It, it doesn't matter that they were in Canada or U.S. or anywhere else. Just the story alone of 
how things happen, what weather does to a mountain. All those components are so they're all little seeds, like golden nugget seeds that just sprout into whole different avenues of education and thought patterns and awareness and, and things like that. So even if it's a different sport, just starting there and taking that for uh, all of its worth and, and then move into how does that apply to me? How does that apply to my sport? How does that apply to my friends? I know somebody that snowmobiles. How does it apply to them? Do they know about it? I'll bring it up next time I see them. Hey, did you ever think about avalanches? Or have, what have you done? Like We're a community of people mm-hmm. that want to have fun together. We're a community of people that want to have social interaction with others. And if someone's dead on the side of the mountain, we're not going to have that social interaction with them ever again. So uh, looking out for each other, considering each other's safety, you know, asking somebody if they know something, seems kind of like arrogant, but at the same time, you're looking for out for them. You're trying to help them in a way that, you know, mm-hmm. you, you can't do through a text message, right? Like you, have you done this? Like, I want to make sure that you're safe and that I see you next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it changes people's lives when you lose somebody, uh, let's say in a car accident or an avalanche or whatever else you, you get scared of driving the car. You get scared of going back out there. Um, and you feel you get survivor guilt, you know, and, um, right. you know, there's a fella in Utah this year. I was in, just in Utah teaching and uh, a father's son, you know, like our, our backcountry rule in snowmobiling is you must have a transceiver probe and shovel. And um, the kid had a transceiver probe and shovel, but dad had nothing. And then this kid got buried. And uh, then he's got he's got to sit there and wait. And how is he going to recover his kid? Something that you you said earlier was uh, about when you when you had broken your back, um, you had all the tools and you had all the training, but the guys with you didn't necessarily have that same concept. And uh, something Mm -hmm. that you talked about in your in your talk was not only do I want to have the equipment myself, but I want my buddy with me to have the equipment himself. Uh, I think the example you gave Mm -hmm. up was like an old version versus a new version that do different things and have different frequencies and and all Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Right. Um, And so if I'm going out onto this adventure with, with Ian, I'm going to want to make sure that he is aware that he's prepared and that he's equipped to do the exact same thing that I'm going to want to be able to do for him. Right. Um, Yeah. But for, for me with the broken back, if I was unconscious, I should have learned my lesson real quick. It's about who you go out in the backcountry with, too. It's a team sport, you know. And if they don't have the same skills that you do, it's kind of it's kind of like your buddy showing up with a 2008 Polaris Ranger and saying, "Hey, let's go," you know. And it just isn't the right machine for what you guys want to adventure and do. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you know, I was really planning on pushing up to this mountain peak today, and that machine's probably going to break down. It's old, it's not maintained, and I'm going to get 50 miles into the bush and not get to do what I wanted to do that day. You, you don't pick to go riding with those people, and it is a team effort back there, and everybody act, has to have the knowledge and the understanding, and it's a group effort to, to mitigate the problems. So um, it's hard when you get the guy that doesn't know how to run the winch right and burns up his winch, right? Yep. And uh, those there. sorts of issues. Yeah. So. And just uh, as, a, as a quick call out, uh, just because you have a winch, if you have a 3,500 pound winch and you're on tracks and you're stuck deep four feet in snow and on the <laughs> side of a mountain, anything. <laughs> it, that winch doesn't mean anything at all. Yeah. It, that's a tease. Like, so it's a yep. different world in the snow. It's a different world in the back country and snow and the like, mud even. And yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so that's why these mud machines that are out doing the big bounty holes and stuff have like freaking 35,000 pound winches and stuff like that. Like they're big machines, mm-hmm. they're stuck deep, they're stuck hard, and they're going to be impossible to get out otherwise. Uh, so in the snow, uh, it's a different world. Just having a winch is a false sense of security. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to hear you say that because the unit I had, I, you know, I got that thing planted a couple times. And uh, as a snowmobiler, I, there's an art to getting unstuck in the snow. Yep. And my cute little 3,500-pound winch wouldn't help me do anything. But if you know how to manipulate the snow and pack it, yeah, I just got, I packed it all out. Took me an hour and a half. It crawls right out, right? Yep, last so time I was stuck in the snow, it took me three hours, so. So once you learn how to pack it and move snow, you can, you know, snow isn't dirt. You can easily move it around. And right. it, man, even when my machine would break, I could actually lift it up like it was uh, sitting on a on a lift system yeah. by just using the snow and dugging, digging it out. <laughs> yeah, um, my, put a track back on. Or... My strategy for getting uh, snowmobiles unstuck traditionally is a lot of really, really bad language. 
and uh, <laughs> shovel, and then eventually we get out. But yeah, <laughs> so let's a sore back. <laughs> so let's get out of the seriousness of all this and get towards uh, this machine that you built. Um, can you dive in a little bit? We're looking at some pictures of what you built uh, here, and this was uh, what ten years ago. Yeah, ten years ago. It's a 2010 Polaris Ranger, and and uh, I was just kind of curious, like what they could do with the, the track systems were new at the time. The Camoplast had a system and. Um, so I put, I put some tracks on it and with a 50 horsepower, 80, uh, 800 CC motor, I was shocked where I could put that thing. And, and I was in love. So I custom built a cab with a fellow I know here in town. And, uh, and I was ripping around all the, the, you know, the groom trails from snowmobiling and snowboarding out of it. And it was great. And then I started, you know, cause being a snowmobiler, I started learning, I could build a road system with this on on and on and throughout the snow and as he packed down really your trail good yeah. yeah packed down my trail and i was like wow i'm skiing like big lines this is great it's a gondola for the back country you know but it was kind of slow and me being a, a motorhead uh, i couldn't leave it alone so i bought an old nitro and i ripped the the nitro snowmobile apart with a turbo on it and uh and i cut the frame and i i slammed that thing in there and um uh, yeah, so now I'm pumping 210 horse to a set of tracks, and uh, uh, but then the tracks started being a problem. The bearings started getting chewed up because, you know, there was too much side torsional uh, pressure on the bearings, so they got hot and warped out the uh, the yokes of the axles and stuff. Um, so then I got the TDD track system with a sprocket drive, and uh, I kept going and going. And um, uh, yeah, now like any mod, it's uh, sitting in the back of my yard as a uh, lawn ornament but um, <laughs> uh, um and probably could run but i was ripping axles out and stuff but now you got these things that are coming out of the box that have the right horsepower that have the right track setups with more speed you got al mcbeth over there custom building some tracks that have some speed the apache track system from can am has some speed the suspension matches it like you can put these things some crazy spots and if you know, I had the time and effort and a little more money, I'd be building another one. Um, you know, but I just don't have the time and I and I look forward to it. I think they're a crazy new machine to enjoy the backcountry in, and especially in snow. Yeah, we got a um, we got an rat. We got an event popping off next weekend on the Oregon sand, and uh, we've been trying to get Al to come out to it, but we can't get him out of the snow. <laughs> if you follow his, <laughs> if you follow his Instagram, you can see why. That's for sure. Speaking of Instagram, I just followed you on there. It looks like you've got some background with single track stuff, UTV. I mean, like you said, snowboard, snowmobile as well. Yeah, you know, I uh, uh, I, I met a fellow a while ago, um, Mark Healy. He's a big wave surfer. And- we were hanging out drinking beers. He's like, man, you got to stop putting your Instagram as some pro snowmobiler. You're more of a mountain man than, than a, than For a sure. snowmobiler. Yep. So, uh, I, I love being in the back country in any form or fashion. May that be walking with a helicopter uh, in, in any sort of way. I, I just love being back there. Um, it's a great thing for a human to get in touch with nature. And, and I think it's fabulous, the motorized use of getting more people back there appreciating uh what we have in north america here. yeah we'll, we'll definitely keep you in the loop of some of the stuff that we have going on too like we're trying to kind of trend towards and spearhead some of the overland type efforts on utv and uh, we definitely see that as something that's developing i was actually talking to a guy in bc and he wants he wanted me to plot and uh plan the mackenzie grease trail up in british columbia which essentially is from Kelowna to the coast it's never yeah. been done on mm-hmm. a UTV before, and I'm just like, well, if it's never been done, you got you have my attention, <laughs> you know. So yeah, we'll definitely keep you in the loop on some of that stuff. It's a lot of fun to be had out there for sure. Yeah, well, the scene outside, like just outside of Revelstoke and Sycamus, Enderby, Kelowna, Vernon area, is actually getting quite big. People are heavily into the UTV things, and as they get better, there's some guys racing. Actually, Al Macbeth's rig sitting at my buddy uh, Lauren's right now in Revy, and. Uh, you know, it's, it's becoming a thing, and I see this track thing becoming a thing and uh, side-by-siding becoming a, a, a really big thing in our area. The Forest Service roads just let you access so much terrain, and uh, and it's just terrain that you don't get to see unless it's a poor man's helicopter. Yeah, you know? snow bikes and, uh, are going crazy down here, too. Oh, yeah, snow bikes in Idaho, I think, are where it's at. Yeah. The snow bikers are, so, are kind of hard to reach out to about the avalanche problem, but they create their own issues uh, a little bit more than the snowmobiling in some ways. 
what would be the difference between a guy on a on a sled going up up the side of a a, a face versus a, a snow bike? How does that uh, a lot differ? slower? Well, well, the big difference is is yeah, the slow bike. Um, the big difference is uh, once those machines have a hundred horse, those snow bikes, it'll change the game. Um, but you know, the big difference is right now with a snow, with a snowmobile, we attack big, more open terrain, and so we deal with class three avalanche problems with that run out into flat areas a lot of the ways or smaller terrain traps where snow bikers are really attracted to tight trees, but still really steep terrain. But usually what that means, especially in Idaho, is that terrain falls into a creek bed and they're side hilling through the trees and they don't yep. think they're an avalanche train and they've got three, four, five people and all of a sudden the slab it just isn't enough anchorage in the trees and it pulls and puts them into a train trap. So Really, what they need to learn is understand a couple of the key factors in the snowpack that will help them say, hey, you know what, today's not the day to use that train. And that's the thing. Hashtag nothing bad happens 90% of the time in the backcountry. It's good to go. It's just can you tell when the 10% is? And some sports need to focus on this problem and some sports need to focus on that problem. And and for snow biking, it's really understanding surface core development because that uh, that's one layer in the snowpack that they need to understand that's going to get them into trouble in those steep creeks. Yeah. And the big, big thing there is, is actually looking like a lot of us mm-hmm. just go out and go full bore, full throttle and, and don't look back. Uh, if you take the time to stop and look and analyze, uh, you know, and, and along the, tr- along the trail too, like where you start and where you end up and along the way are all different scenarios. And if you're trained to know what to look for, uh, at least you can stop hit that snow, cut it out, look at it, and then move forward and make your decision. If you're not even aware of the fact that you have to even pull that apart to look at it, you're not going to make a good choice. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's the thing, too, is, like, I think a lot of people in this world think that we want you to dig snow pits and stuff. No, we want you to understand snow. We want you to be able to observe the signs that nature is talking to you with. And we want you to be able to, you know, for me, I teach people if there's a problem in the the top three feet of the snowpack, the reverse button, rah, dig a hole, pop the sled back out, have a look at the, the the layers inside the snowpack, helps you recognize when there is a weak layer in the snowpack. But I must teach you a little bit. So that that analogy of learning to drive, um, you know, it took your dad quite a, quite a few uh, attempts to teach you the gas pedal and the brake. And then you learned the signal light and the stop sign, then drove around a small town. It was a graduated process. And now everybody can drive. But how well are you going to drive in Japan? And that's what you're doing. You're driving vehicles in Japan, and you haven't learned to read the signs. And And the avalanche world needs to customize courses for the user group, not these generalized courses. And, uh, and that's really where the avalanche culture needs to change to match these motorized users, is focus uh, on what that motorized community needs. Because the skiers and snowboarders built a lot of that, and that's great. And they've got a good foundation for us. Um, but do I need to analyze the snowpack in a, a full profile pit? Sure. If I get out of a helicopter and I'm going to expose myself to three to 4,000 vertical feet worth of 30 to 45 degree terrain. Yeah. You know what? And I'm an individual single person on that with maybe people that are really well spaced out. I need to understand the snow a lot more, but as a snowmobile, I can duck, dodge, dive and dive very quickly. So it's about taking in observations and, and a lot of different observations because I'm going to see north, east, west aspects. I'm going to be at the top of the mountain, at the mid of the mountain, where the skier is going to be exposed to one south aspect for the majority of his day. So, you know, the avalanche culture really needs to get behind uh, customizing some education for the users. So uh, Ian has been itching this whole time to know what kind of technology and gadgets that you carry around with you day to day. Uh, what kind of uh, stuff are you taking in your backpack, uh, like mo- like product products that you're taking with you that uh, kind of that inside the backpack kind of exploratory uh, conversation? What are you carrying with yeah, you? Yeah, you can actually take that to uh, actually gear that you wear. You know, I, I'm, I, I've got some sponsorship stuff that I do. I'm sure you're the same way. But, uh, you know, in terms of how I layer, uh, in terms of what I put on the outside, I, I put thought into all that stuff. I was just kind of mm-hmm. interested into what you see, what you use, what you're seeing that's working, and uh, you know maybe some areas that that could even be improved on or something. You know, because we're by and large when we go on these overland trips, it's pretty pretty warm outside, so you can get away with uh, forgetting some stuff. You can get away with uh, like in the event of a, a catastrophic failure, if you had to camp out, mm-hmm. your risk is pretty minimal. But we wanna we wanna jump into some more. Um, 
uh, I guess, dangerous type situations where, where weather and climate become a reality. I'm looking at a run right now in Utah where you've got microsystems to contend with and you have to literally decide in real time whether or not you're going to try and outrun it or stay, camp out and let it pass, you know, mm-hmm. all kinds of all kinds of factors that go in. But uh, yeah, that's kind of open ended. Take that wherever you want. Yeah. So, you know, as a snowmobiler in the winter, um, I'm a monist. I don't, I don't want to carry so much weight on my back. My back's been damaged a few times. So, you know, there's some vital stuff I need to keep on my back. That's better on my person in case my snowmobile gets buried. Um, you know, also I keep a lot of the survival equipment on the machine. I'm confident that if it was to get buried in a slide or something, that I can recover that machine for some of the content. So, you know, it's this Swiss cheese of holes that need to line up and you try to mitigate those. So, Actual equipment I'm, I'm wearing is, even from my clothing, is fundamentally important. So, you know, I wear a wicking base layer that pulls the sweat off me. And that's really important for survival that you're dry. For right? sure. So that wicks it off. Then there's a fleece layer that pulls it to the next level. And then the actual outerwear I'm wearing allows that to vent off and keeps me dry. That's a huge survival thing. So for myself and the risks that I take, that's the top-notch gear there alone. Same with the socks. And the boots, uh, they all have to keep you dry and not sweating. So it starts there, really. And then the helmet, you know, for myself, super lightweight, um, just because, you know, I got some huck neck from being a goof. And uh, so for me, that's important. Uh, and then what comes into my helmet is I have a set of Connect Smart headphones. Now, I've been working to help design these with the guy. They plug into a VHF UHF radio right here. And I can speak by just talk, talking and pushing a button right here. And sure, it Bluetooths to my, my phone for music. That's great. But, you know, we started off with that Bluetooth on. That's a problem to my Avalanche transceiver that I'm wearing. Right. So now we've designed it so it only looks for a Bluetooth signal for a minute. And if it doesn't find it, it shuts its Bluetooth functions off. And it just works as my radio. Uh, it also wires into an a iPod shuffle that I put up here. But that shuffle, not an iPod Classic or anything, does not affect my Avalanche transceiver. No radio. So what? What company? What company was the uh, the headphones again? Uh, his Connect the Smart. Company's Connect with a K, uh, and he's got an Instagram, and he's really thinking things through. The other great thing about what we're working on with him is that those headphones have uh, centrifugal force data. So if it hits a certain force, it'll actually trigger my UHF VHF radio with an emergency signal that will radio my other uh, my other companions. Yeah, we're looking at them Uh, right now. Those are slick. So we haven't quite dialed that in yet, but it's pretty sweet. You know, you just plug your helmet in with a just standard connector charges, and uh, super stoked on where that company is going. so yeah, I mean, if I can't listen to gonna... death metal while I'm riding, I mean, what's the point, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hey, man, you never know. I might be classical. <laughs> um, Don't let the tattoos fool you. Yeah. <laughs> so as you're uh, preparing to go out, what kind of tools are you putting in? And, and just real quick before you get to the tools, uh, you said the transponder, right? And and um, knowing from, from some of the talks you've given, uh, there's a difference between a transponder and a beacon, right? Yeah, so the transceiver, it's an avalanche transceiver, not a beacon. And we had a problem where people thought they were, when Spot first came out, the uh, the GPS location device, or they were calling it a beacon, and still are, uh, they were confused. They thought they bought an avalanche beacon, but they just bought a, a Spot location beacon. So it's important, because uh, somebody died that way, actually. <laughs> and because and when we showed up with search and rescue, they were looking for their friend with the GPS location device. Two different things. So an avalanche transceiver is meant to be worn on your person. So I wear one, Mamut. Uh, and I will not bullshit about uh, rescue equipment. Uh, Ford Chevy Dodge, Polaris Skidoo, you know, they all have good points and bad points. When it comes to safety equipment, I'll highlight whatever it is. Sponsors, non-sponsors, don't care. The new Mamut S is by far uh, steps and heads uh, advance of other avalanche transceivers. Um, so I wear that. Important to wear. Uh, absolute must for snowmobiling, skiing, snow biking. That's what saves you. So important to recognize those. Uh, a probe is also always in my backpack. That's the long device, the cute little sticky thing. That's how we actually finally locate people. The transceiver gets you close. The probe gets you the exact location, 
and then of course a high quality uh, avalanche rescue shovel and they're not all made equal uh i was over at a, a friend's place who might even be watching this in utah who had been to a couple of my talks and then all of a sudden he shows up to one of my courses with a crappy lifelink shovel from costco i was able to break it in my hands <laughs> great got another shitty shovel out of the back country um so they're not all made equal but those things are always on my person and then there's a pair of socks and multiple pairs of gloves in my backpack with a uhf vhf radio um and of course all the codes to a lot of the local operators um and that is my communication device to my companions that particular radio unit uh, can be a garmin uh, but garmin's only work on one band of radio frequency uh, so you actually have to have a radio license to be working on the commercial bands. Uh, so some people might be able to acquire that or some people might not be able to. But then that's mic'd so I can actually talk here or plug into my helmet to talk. And, uh, and then getting into first aid, uh, I have multiple 80-hour wilderness first aid courses, so it's the knowledge. I stay minimalist on that. Um, and I've also, so that gives us in Canada a little bit of a, a paramedic ticket for being able to hand out or, or distribute uh, pain meds, those sorts of things. So Tylenol, Advil, all those sorts of things control swelling. Um, so my first aid kit, of course, is a minimalist, but uh, fairly decent. And then pen flares uh, are a huge thing. Pen flares, bear bangers, a great communication tactic. Um, I have multiples of those in there as well. And then a classic toolkit that matches my unit, uh, haywire, zip ties, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, makes it pretty feasible to fix pretty much anything on snowmobile mil with 10 millimeter wrench and screwdriver. 10 millimeter uh, end wrench. <laughs> yeah. So uh, carrying an assortment of tools that way as well and bivvies. So a bivy sack if I have to sleep overnight in the snow cave. And really the actual knowledge how to build a proper Quincy and fires. I carry tampons. Uh, tampons are a great blood soaker, a great way to dip fuel out of your tank for fire starter. Um, you know, the knowledge of, you know, surviving in the winter with a sled is as simple as taking your side panel off to sit at on it beside a fire instead of sitting on the cold snow, uh, things like that. Um, you know, if my lighters and my torch lighters aren't working, I have a spark plug. I just have to take it out of the spark plug hole. Uh, quite easy to light a fire with that way. So knowledge goes a long way with the equipment. Um, to becoming a minimalist of what you're carrying, you have to have knowledge. And uh, uh, so I, I, I narrow that down. And then into communication devices, uh, when I have my commercial operation going, uh, like guiding and or teaching in the backcountry, I carry a sat phone. The only reason I carry an Iridium sat phone, I carry it is so I can talk directly to a, a doctor, an emergency physician. Um, if I'm traveling recreationally wise, I, right now I'm using a bivy stick, it's called, and it's a guy out of Salt Lake City. Um, but what I like about the bivy is it works on the Iridium uh, satellite network. It Bluetooths to your phone, and you can text and use some mapping and get weather information from it. But what I like about it is also a battery backup. So if my phone does die, that I'm depending on, I just have another uh, portion uh, to charge it. And I actually can charge it if my machine's running as well. So what when is, you're leaning on electrical stuff, it's kind of key to have a backup plan. What is your opinion on these uh, pieces of equipment? You're saying the bivy stick, right? Uh, that mm -hmm. requires you to have the cell phone to work with it. Um, and I see a lot of technology moving that way in the outdoors world where it's like, well, our thing works and it connects to your phone and it does all this fancy stuff because of the phone, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I've always had this kind of like platform of, well, if it, if it can't accomplish what you need on its own, um, you know, that's something to consider because your phone might be dead. The cold weather may have killed the battery. Um, the, it may have gotten separated from you. You may have forgotten it in the truck. Um, and so I think I there's something to be said for, uh, something that works on its own and has its own backup system of notification. Like if there's an emergency button on the device versus requiring you to send a text message via your phone. I completely concur. So the bivy, you can push an SOS and, and why I'm okay with it is actually, uh, I have two separate units. I have my phone that, that I use as a GPS, that Bluetooth as well. And then I have my other phone. So I have a kind of a backup plan, but I completely agree with you. Like some of the devices that text as well as Bluetooth over 
are fabulous. I, I try to mitigate that. I recognize that the problem's there and that it needs a backup plan. And, uh, and I try to install that. Um, so, you know, uh, Spot makes a, a texting device slash Bluetooth, but I have a tough time with the Global Star Network. Uh, it was functioning really well for the last four years, but uh, I have a Global Star sat phone that hasn't been very dependable. Um, people must know for satellite communication, if you're underneath a northerly aspect, you don't get out. Your GPS signal will get lost, right? Oh, right. So you need to move around to actually get that communication. So another key thing with knowledge. But yeah, to back to your point, a great highlight is that if you do are using some of those devices, like the smaller in reach now and, and those things, you do lose that opportunity of being able to text. And uh, I do have an older in reach that you're able to text from still to and, and, and agree with that uh as things start changing um two-way communication recreationally wise is key but the other key thing is that i don't just who are you going to text that's right. the thing who, who are you going to text and what and do they actually know what to do next and what the plan is and do they know how to relay that information are they going to be calm you know i uh in, in our world here you know search and rescue sometimes can't access where we are so as our friend group we have a plan you know, and uh, if if Lauren's wife, if he doesn't come home, she has a list of people that he, that she calls until one of us answer the phone. Then we take that information and she has taken all the information that he left her, what radio channels he was operating on, where he was going for sure. And uh, and what time he was supposed to be back and who he was with. And so we get all that information. We take that and we start analyzing the problem. We'll notify search and rescue and we'll start trying to manage it ourselves first, right? Because uh, a lot of the times where we go and at the level that we we ride, search and rescue ain't coming for us. Uh, so we depend on ourselves. And um, and and that's what you should do. You're responsible for yourself in the backcountry. For sure. But you know what? Search and rescue for a lot of users, you know, can offer uh, a, a lot of help, right? So... So uh, I think that uh, comment about uh, the person back home knowing what to do next is a huge part of it, right? So we we spoke already about the fact that they just the the opportunity of knowledge is there for them to translate that to someone that can help, but uh, knowing who to call and and when to call and what the next steps are for you and and your friends and your and your support system, um, if you don't talk about it, it doesn't happen. So, um, you know, that would be something if you're somebody that is investing into a track system on your side by side and you're going to be going out in the backcountry a lot and you're planning on spending your hours back there, um, that if, uh, if you can make sure that everybody that is related to you and attached to you is on the same page, has the same knowledge, has the same game plan of reaction and reactionary timing. Yeah. And it's, it's so key because without that, all the communication starts breaking down and all your efforts that you've put in to protecting yourself collapse. So it, you know, if you do have, and you've created that plan, my advice to people is have somebody critique it, talk about it, be open-minded about what you're doing and, and share it over a couple beers at the restaurant, you know, and yeah, this is what I'm doing. And somebody's going to be like, well, did you think of this? And right. five heads are better than one out there. And it, sure. it's just really hard when, when people, lose a life or they lose a limb when it was, uh, was a manageable situation with an afterthought. Right. Well, um, you know, Jeremy, I really appreciate your time, uh, connecting with us on this topic. Uh, I think this is a discussion that as you're aware, could go on and on and on and on, uh, and go down, you know, 20 different rabbit holes of, of specialization. Um, first, uh, uh, how can people get a hold of you? Where can they find you? Uh, how can they get educated? A lot, like I said, a lot of these guys are overlapping sport people where they're in snowmobiles and things like that. Um, if they're looking for training, where can they go? And uh, what kind of um, just connections can they make with you or your team or other industry partners that you would uh, recommend? Well, first and foremost, the avalanche problem, of course, your local avalanche center for forecasting. And then if, if you're looking for me, you can find me at soulrides.ca hanky jair on instagram um and or my business soul rides on instagram if you're looking for some guiding i do another uh, uh another business called mountain stash adventures but my advice is like if you guys are looking to start leading this industry a little bit uh a guy like me you can 
hire me, come down and teach eight people and customize the course. There's other guys like Duncan Lee is a good counterpart of mine in California that can customize an avalanche course and even give you some advice in that course about being in the backcountry and what you can carry. Uh, our experience helps that a, a long way. So uh, what those costs are, you know, we can customize that and, and figure those sorts of things out. Um, you know, that, that source, that Vimeo source for avalanche problems, like uh, the, the throttle decisions piece, is it, more I think about it as, as this conversation goes on, what a great piece to learn the basics from yep. uh, about the avalanche mitigation. Um, as far as adventuring uh, in the backcountry, um, you know, there's tons of people to learn from. And uh, uh, just consider the source of your information. Just because somebody says there's something doesn't mean they're that experienced and they may want to extract money from you. 100%. Uh, so always consider the source of your information. And, you know, for me, not that I want my message center blowing up, but if you've got a serious question, I'm always open. I just like being in the backcountry, and, and I want to see people live through those things. If you want to call me and ask me how the snow is in Revelstoke, please don't do that. But <laughs> if you've got a couple of silly questions about a bivy stick or, or some communication tactics, yeah, look me up. Hit me up on Messenger. It might take a day or two. I'm a busy dude. But, uh, yeah, I just like being in the backcountry like everybody else. So, Yeah, Um Great information, Jeremy. Uh, always great to see your uh, beautiful face again. And uh, I really enjoyed our episode today. Uh, everybody, if uh, if you could, go follow them. Check them out. Uh, check Soul Rides. Uh, support what they're doing in the industry. If you're a, a cross-sport athlete, uh, take the time to look in what they're doing, the resources they provide, and get yourself educated. There's nothing more important than just knowing that there's something to know. So uh, we hopefully brought up that topic to you. And now it's up to you to start following through with some of those resources and education points. Uh, we really want everybody to have the safest, most uh, amazing experience they can. And uh, we looking forward to all the stories of these guys getting back out in the back country and tearing it up and getting those epic pictures and videos and uh, having those experiences that will last a lifetime of storytelling. So um, really looking forward to, uh, you know, where this conversation goes after this podcast, uh, how that impacts the industry as a whole, and uh, the just the progression and where it's going and, and how that all is accumulated. Uh, together. Uh, super excited. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks for having me. And then thanks for uh, kind of leading your your whole new sport in the backcountry into a, a positive place. Yeah, definitely check out his Instagram. He looks great with a bear skin draped over his back. It's it, it's rad. <laughs> so that, that was just with him without a shirt on. So you're oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, those were the pictures I was looking for. So. Ooh, easy, easy. Those in, cost money. Instant, <laughs> instant stalker here. Yeah. So uh, everybody, thanks for joining us today on the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. And uh, maybe next time we'll call it the Snow Podcast. But uh, uh, anyways, thanks, Jeremy, for showing up. Ian, thanks for joining me. Appreciate and uh, it, Jeremy. we'll see you next time. Thank you. Peace. Peace.